Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Today's show is sponsored by Sourcewell. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager. I have a special guest today. His name is Ron Carr. He has, maybe you've seen him on the BBC or the morning show, CBS, ABC. He is author of four books. He's spoken on six continents. We're going to talk a little bit about his newest book today, The Velocity Mindset, but uh, he's also a friend. So, Ron, thanks for being on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Pleasure to be here and to support you and your audience. And, I'm, and that's right. And you're going to give some some greatness to our audience. I know that. And you're in New York today. I'm in New Jersey, which New is Jersey. just on the other side of the river of New York. Uh Oh, big faux pas to start. <laughs> 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 Let's get into it. You know, Ron, tell us a few things for anybody that doesn't know you. A uh, couple little known facts about Ron Carr. Well, I'm known as a sales expert because I was in sales and sales management. And I, uh, always came to the companies uh, right after their heyday. So I had to find innovative ways to succeed. And I launched my sales training business in 1988 after a family tragedy. And then it morphed into speaking and consulting and advising board of directors. And then uh, I became president of the National Speakers Association. When I was done, I started asking myself, you know, what's my value that we all do in life? because while I was doing sales and very successful, it was missing just a little bit for me. And at that time I had nine surgeries right after my presidency, mostly on my back. And what I realized is that my business morphed into leadership because I was coaching a lot of CEOs on how to build high-performing sales cultures. And one of the things that I teach salespeople and uh, CEOs is that vulnerability sells. When you're vulnerable, that's what makes the emotional connection with others. And then they tend to want to hear your story. And so I realized, you know, that one of the things that I couldn't, I couldn't penetrate, you know, because I had a Titan principle, I had lead seller get out of the way as my previous books. I just couldn't really give a grasp to what I was really about in, in, in these days when I was looking for more um, significance, if you will. And, uh, the individual that was working on my new videotape called me up and it says, I got it. You go, what? He goes, velocity mindset. And it hit me. And I said, well, how'd you come up with that? He goes, I didn't. You did. That's all you talk about. Number one, you don't even recognize it. And your materials talk about it and they mention it for the last 10 years. So I thought about it and I realized, you know, I, uh, I came from an abused childhood. You know, it wasn't because my father didn't love me. He was a Holocaust survivor, and it's well documented that kids of Holocaust survivors tend to be abused because they're so damaged. You know, they just really don't know how to handle life situations, if you will. And coming from that, I had a lot of, uh, I, I hadn't, didn't have a lot of, I had no confidence. And, uh, you know, I go to college and then I, I start working. And it took me a while, you know, to get out from underneath that and then finally realize my strength and, and, and what I can give to the world. But what I realized was how much time I lost, hmm. how much time I lost because of that lack of confidence that didn't allow me to go after the things that I wanted. And so now you, you fast forward about 45, 50 years, you know, and I'm after those surgeries and you know, I'm 64 now, so I'm going, you know, for what I call is my last four. I mean, we can say the back nine, but round it back four, let's say. You know, I realize time's not, you know, not plentiful, if you will, but there's still a lot of time to make great contributions. And so the first thing that comes to you say, oh, man, I wish I didn't waste all that time. And so what I realized I was put onto this earth was to teach people how we put self-imposed limitations in ourselves, which in effect stop us from going after what we want. And that's just a big crying shame. What would that be? What's a, what's a limitation we're putting on ourselves? Our stories. Hmm. So we all have stories as to certain things happen to us when we're young, and then we create a story as to what we think it is. So when I was getting out from under for what I went through with my dad, I remember speaking to a mentor and she said to me, look, 
what your father did to you, he did for his own reasons. But once it happened, you created a story as to what you think it meant. How do you change the story? Well, first of all, you got to recognize it's a story. Actually, you got to recognize that everything we think is a story. It's our perception of what's happening. So if we can acknowledge it's the story, then you can easily change stories. But if you think it's reality, it's hard to change reality. So the first thing is to acknowledge that it's a story. And the second thing that is to ask yourself, what led to that story? And then how is that story impacting you? And if it's not impacting you positively, what can you do to go about and change it? And what, how did you change your story? I mean, that still seems daunting <laughs> after something challenging like that. It's like, um, you know, I, I, I thought we might talk about sales, but this is life. I mean, let's talk about this. What, well, how do I change? Everybody, I sit next to people. I was just talking half an hour ago. I sit next to CEOs and leaders and uh, sometimes presidents of countries countries or companies, and there are many have imposter syndrome. They're scared to death. They're going to be fil- found out. They're shameful. And just like you, actually, our, our data last year, I'm jumping around here, but found 92% of people would trust their senior leaders more if they were more vulnerable about yes. their mistakes, about their mistakes, not just vulnerable, but about their mistakes. People don't relate on, I'm the champion of this and the president of that. They relate on this, no, hey, yeah. I failed. So, but um, so one, I see the realization there and how that makes us authentic. We all, everybody else knew you were imperfect. So let's, you know, let's acknowledge it, right? But how do I, I still think, I think this is challenging for people. They might even recognize it, but not know what to do to retell or change the story. Well, the, the, the first, well, <laughs> a couple of things. One of the things that I realized in my sales career and coaching CEOs and actually, when companies come to us looking for a new executive or, or a sales executive and we use our assessments, the one thing we look for a high rating on is empathy. All right. If you don't have empathy, you can't be there for somebody. But it starts with personal empathy. It starts with empathy for yourself. It starts by giving yourself a break. Um, we're too hard on ourselves, number one. Um, I remember when I became a speaker, you know, we both belong to NSA. I realized about eight years later, after I became a speaker, I became a speaker for the wrong reason. Because I thought if I could stand up on stage and quote unquote, be naked in front of an audience and get comfortable with that, then I slayed my father's dragons. That was the wrong reason to be up on that stage. You know, I was doing it for myself, not for the audience. And when I started to realize that and I started to say, and when I also started to realize, you know, the one thing I wanted to do when I went on stage was I had to be the best speaker they ever heard. Why? Because it would make up for all the things my father taught me when I was a young kid. You're a fraud. Wait until they find that out. And, you know, that's what I had to overcome. Well, the reality is I was setting myself up for failure. Because to sit there and say you're going to be the best speaker someone's ever heard, that's impossible. When people ask me, who's your best speaker? I say, well, it depends. I got several of them for different reasons. All right. But if I want to be the best speaker anybody had, I'm setting myself up for failure. And when I realized that the best thing that I can do when I'm on stage is just tell my story. They're there to hear something from me. And all I need to do is share my story as to what, why they hired me, the meeting planner. And when I do that, number one, I'm not trying to act. I'm not trying to be something that I'm not. And that's when the vulnerability comes. And when you also understand that it's okay to admit mistakes, and as you said, David, a second ago, it's actually very powerful to admit mistakes. Actually, for your business and what you do with the trusted edge, it automatically starts developing trust. Because when people can admit when they made mistakes, you start trusting them more than when people sugarcoat things or glance over it, okay? Mm -hmm. So trust, as you well know, is a very big thing in any kind of relationship or any kind of influence. So going back to your question about how do we change our stories, there was a book that I read because when I had all those back surgeries and half my back is fused, someone told me to read this book called Healing Back Pain by Dr. John Sarno. I've recommended that book to 200 people. It's a game changer. Sarno was a pain med doc at NYU in the 1980s. And he couldn't understand it. He goes, how can a dead nerve create pain in somebody? And yet he's giving all these opiates, but they're not getting any better. So he started analyzing the brain and he realized that in the 1980s, the malady 
was ulcers. And all of a sudden they disappeared because of medicine. What took over was back pain. And what he stumbled upon was in the subconscious, there are things we don't want to get near. And when we start getting near those things, often our mind will create a diversion pain that takes us away from that. And he was able to identify several reasons of why that may happen. And one was a common characteristic called in, uh, perfectionism. And the other one was goodism. A lot of people want to be perfectionists and they want to be good to everybody. They do it to the detriment of themselves. And because they're trying to avoid seeing themselves what they really are, and therefore the brain takes over and they create a diversion or pain. I'm simplifying it, but sure. it's an amazing book if people want to we'll, read. We'll put that in the show notes, trustedleader. Sure. Trusted, trustedleadershow.com. And uh, we'll put all the show notes right there. So that's that's a great recommendation. Wow. So that helped you change so stories. I, yeah. So when I uh, read that book, I went back to every phase of my life when I was a young kid to now when I had significant pain episodes. And I realized it was a situation where I was under a story that didn't serve me well. It was a lack of confidence. Who's going to go out with me? Who's going to do this? Or who's going to buy this? And I can just trace every pain episode to that. And so what I had to realize is that perfectionism, you know, and we all hear this phrase that I've used with my clients, failure is not an option. It's a great phrase because it shows you dedication. But if it's overused, that's when you go for perfectionism and you're really hurting yourself. There is no such thing as perfectionism. It's how do you move the needle forward? How do you go from point A to B? How do you help others move forward? How do you help yourselves move forward? So at the end of the day, you're seeing progress and you're feeling good about yourself. How are you doing that now, progress? How are you personally uh, progressing? We'll get to the book in a in a bit, but how how do you how are you moving forward these days? Sixty four, a lot of brilliance, a lot of success in certain ways, but what about now? Well, you know, I had um, as you know. an emergency uh, open heart surgery to replace an aorta valve. And uh, it went well. And, uh, and obviously we're nowhere here. So I'm thankful for that. Um, but when you go through that uh, game changing surgery and you come cl- close to your mortality, you start thinking about the essence of life and, and the fear of death that you may have. So there was another book that I read. that was also a game changer called uh, Staring at the Sun by Irv Yalom. And, and he is a specialist uh, that, that specializes in the fear of death. And one of the things that he's, he talks about in that book is that we're all going after the wrong thing. And that's why when it comes to the end of our day, sometimes it's hard for some people to move on because we're all going for legacy. We're all going for people to remember us five, 15 years. And he goes, the reality is no one's gonna remember you in 50 years. No one's even going to remember you in 100 years. Your grandchildren you know, won't be here and so forth. So why are you going for that? He goes, what you really should go for is what he called rippling, R-I-P-P-L-I-N-G. When you think about it, if I do something and I share something with you, David, and you enact it in your life, all right, there was a positive thing that I contributed to the world through you. You in turn now are going to turn that into a rippling effect because you're going to share it with other people like you do with your show. And then it's going to be shared and shared. And at the end of the day, most people won't even know where it came from, but no one cares. The only thing we do care is that we did what we were supposed to do when we were on this earth and we moved the ball forward. So now, instead of worrying about my legacy, I just worry about rippling. How can I create all these ripples throughout society that I know are going to make a an improvement. So, you know, at the end of a certain period, I look back, I won't feel like I uh, fell short. Hey, it's Anne with the Trust Edge team here. As you know, we are passionate about helping you and your team perform at your best. And that's why David wrote his new book, Trusted Leader. This true to life parable follows the story of a CEO who uncovers the root issue threatening his organization's success. And in the back half of the book, David provides a roadmap for even how to solve those root issues. Get Trusted Leader for your team, your organization, or even just for yourself at trustedleaderbook.com. What's a, what's a way that you're making a ripple now? I mean, I feel like I've, I've been rippled by you, uh, made yeah. better because of knowing you. But tell me something, you're, you're like intentionally, is there something you're thinking, this is one of the ways with my family, with my 
kids. I know your daughter loves you so much. We got, you know, you got a lot of good stuff happening, but how are you making a ripple or how are you trying to? Um, it actually was by, um, uh, taking my consulting to a higher level with these CEOs and being bold enough to get into their issues, not just the business, because, you know, you consult also, okay? Why is it with the same people we, we talk about the same thing three years later, right? It's because they haven't dealt with the story that's been holding them back. So I decided to be more vulnerable with my, uh, the people I coach. And the reason is, is because then they tend to open up, they trust you more. And when I can see real change in them, like one guy had his business in the abyss. He made some mistakes. We told him not to make it. He only went bankrupt, and now he's out of it. And he nearly lost his marriage. But, you know, a lot of the consultant got into the relationship, and now he's flourishing. That, you know, you made a rippling effect. All right? And you know that he passed it on to his wife because they were having a uh, relationship that would hit the snags, if you will, or hit a, hit a roadblock. And now it's better. So she got rippled in effect. It's about making it better for everybody. You know, if you want to look at what rippling is and it just keeps being passed on, you know, it's like when you throw a pebble into a, a lake, you know, and it, and it keeps bouncing. That's what you want to do. Create all those little waves stirring around and rippling and it goes longer and longer and further and further. I love it. Let's jump in. I, I love how personable you are. You have been with my team and, and friends and um, loved as, as president of NSA uh, and, and all that you've done to just ripple before you were so focused on rippling, maybe. Um, but let's, let's talk a little bit about the velocity mindset. Right. Your new book coming out right now, first weekend in May, uh, first week in May. Uh, tell us about, the, the first of all, the genesis for this a little bit more and um, what it's all about, who it's for. Right. Well, so it's a leadership book, but it's really for everyone because the premise of the book is what would the world look like if everybody acted like a leader? And what I mean by that is taking responsibility. You know, so for example, when I, when I, when I teach sales executives and when I teach the CEOs or, or, or leaders, anybody, one thing we talk about is if you act like a leader and you want to influence somebody, then the first thing you have to realize your first job is to create a safe environment for them to want to have a conversation with you. That's your responsibility, not theirs. So for salespeople, the number one thing that they have to recognize is that when they call somebody up, they're an interruption. And in the book, we get into the neuroscience because I, I, I stumbled upon it in 2000 working with a major uh, financial services company throughout the entire United States. And they wanted to reduce their sales cycle from five calls. We got it down to three calls. But what I realized was that when they would go knocking on potential investors' doors like retirees, they spent 12 minutes talking about the pictures of the football team that they both supported, the kids, the grandkids. And I can tell in their eyes when I accompany them that they're going, what are you doing here? So cortisol, which is this, the, the fight or flight, you know, flight hormone, we all have. You can't get rid of it. But if you act like a leader, your job is to get the cortisol in a manageable level so they get engaged. So if you understand that the first thing you're likely to do is interrupt them in the day, you have to understand you're spiking the cortisol. So then how do you bring it down? Well, you don't bring it down by talking about you and your products and services mm -hmm. because there's no connection. You need to ask them where they're trying to go and what their biggest challenges are. And then they'll start divulging information because it's about them and not about you. And then they start trusting you. You know, an influence is two parts to the body that are really important, the heart and the mind. The mind is data. The heart is emotional connection. Unfortunately, most people make the worst mistake. When they try to influence others, they go straight to the mind and start shooting all the data, all the reasons why they should accept your premise. But there was no emotional connection. So it's not landing with impact. If you understand as a leader that your first job is to create emotional impact and to create a safe environment for them to want to talk, you're going to do different things on that, in that interaction. 
But just give us a give us one or two insights on coaching because this is hard for everybody. They're trying it to is. break in, they're trying to connect, and they're like, because I think if you if you get on a call and you, it's a cold call, let's just say, it's like nothing will connect. You can't say how is your family. It's inauthentic. You can't say how you doing. That's inauthentic. Right. How would so the first thing you need to do is you got to base it on an outcome. Yeah. People buy outcomes. That's the emotional connection. It's not the features of what you're offering. Number one, right. okay. Fast gutters too yep. soon. All right. So if, if it's a call call or an email, it's uh, it, 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 you want to challenge it maybe a little bit, like the great book, The Challenge of Sale, but it's about an outcome. How would so you get a, there though? Let's say, yeah. How would you get there in a first call? And we're not going to go through your whole process. Right. We can't, but I just think this is an issue for people. This first part to even let them listen, like even right. get anywhere. So, Dave, thank you for taking my call. I, uh, by the way, did I interrupt you in anything right now that you were doing? Yeah, I'm busy. I, I understand that. And I really don't want to take a lot of time. So if you just give me a couple of minutes, I guarantee this will be worth your while and you'll be on your way. Hmm. Okay. The reason I'm calling you, Dave, okay, we've worked with several homeowners in your neighborhood like yours with houses that are about 20 years of age. And one of the things we're realizing that the homeowners are looking for, it's time for a new gutter. Now, I don't know if that's you now or 10 in, in, in a year now, but what I'd like just to share with you so you're ready when the time comes, I want to share the three biggest mistakes that people make when it comes to changing gutters. Would this be the time to do this or would you rather schedule that for another time? Love it. There's a massive difference there. Everybody heard it. Everybody got it. Yeah, so I might say, yes, it's a good time. Okay, and then I don't talk. Remember, it's about them. Right. Remember, I, I got the quota so low, I got to keep it low. Mm -hmm. I got to keep it engaged, not too low. Right. So then I'll say, well, when you put gutters on, what are the three things that are important to you in that process? Uh, I, I want them to be quality. I want them to last I, you know what I'm I'm frustrated about with a lot of people I've had out here is they don't clean up afterwards. That frustrates me. They don't. So I want them to last, and I want it to be done quickly. I I had a project and it took all summer. Okay, now I'm looking at you, and your your eyelids didn't go up, but your eyeballs are yeah up in your socket. And most people are listening to the podcast, but we're looking at each other right. through Zoom. And so the point that I'm saying about this is something happened in your brain when I asked you what are the three things most important to you. What happened at that moment? Because you thought you still were uh, protecting yourself. You knew I was going to sell you something, right? Right. But something changed at that moment. What was it? Well, I started to think about what I wanted. Right. And kind of might need. Okay. And then you shared some of that with me, right? Right. You wouldn't have shared that with me if you didn't start trusting me. Right. Why did yeah. you start trusting me? Because you seemingly had an interest in me. Yeah. And I asked you, what were the three things you wanted? Right. Yeah. And you started trusting me. And did you feel better about this call than you might have expected? Absolutely. So what's happening is there's two more hormones coming into play. Oxytocin, which is the feel good, which is the, uh, the, the trust connector hormone. And then you have dopamine, which is the feel good hormone. But dopamine only rides with oxytocin. And that's where you got to get people. You got to get their cortisol and, and do a manageable level so that you want to be engaged. And then you start building that trust, not talking about yourself, not talking about what you want them to buy, but getting an emotional connection about what's important to them. And then when they see that there's a possibility for hope that you can improve their lives, we come back to ripple, okay? Then they start feeling good. And that's when they're in a position now to hear your solution. If you give your solution before then, it's landing on deaf ears. Well, the reason I'm passionate about this is most of the people listening, they have something that really is a solution. And many people right. aren't buying because we're shutting them off before uh, it's even possible. So if, you know, don't use this sales technique if you have a bunch of junk. But if you have something valuable that can help people, then let's try to help people with it. And that but, starts with an emotional connection. But even, but even um, junk has to have a value. I mean... How many times have you moved? I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to move to Florida and I call some people up for furniture. They don't even want it for free. You know? Yeah. So right. you still have to position it right, right? <laughs> it's all in the positioning. Absolutely. 
So let's let's go a little deeper on on velocity mindset, the overall okay. framework. Well, again, so let's suppose that the the premise of the book is that um, it's for anybody who is a leader, right? You, you you have to act like a leader if you want to gain influence and if you want to get velocity moving. Because how much sooner can I get someone on my side? Another premise of the book is you can't gain velocity or be successful just in the efforts of yourself. You can go further and faster through the efforts of others. Another thing that we talk about, which is really the definition of velocity. If I ask you, David, what's the first word that comes to your mind when you hear the word velocity? The answer is speed. Speed. That's if that's all you think about. You are burnout. Because how many times do we have our to do list and we're going, 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 we're getting it done. All of a sudden, at the end of the day, we go, what did I accomplish? I just set myself back because it wasn't anything geared towards what I was trying to do. So the true definition of velocity is speed with direction. Now, it's the direction where most people screw up on. Look at direction like a goal or the outcome. So if I ask you, what is your goal for this prospecting call you might be making? The biggest mistake most salespeople make, oh, I want to sell the client on my services. That's not a goal, especially if it takes five calls to sell your products. If you're looking to sell it on the first call, you're setting yourself up for failure because it means all you're going to do is try every closing book and the trick in the book. You're going to talk too much. And at the end of the day, they're going to hang up on you and you're not going to get to the second call. An effective goal for that situation is to qualify this prospect to see if they're ideal for you and for them. And then if so, identify what the next path forward is, because then you're now going to do the right actions. To qualify, you're going to ask them what they're looking for. You're going to ask them what they're trying to do. You're going to see if it's something for you, right? And then and then if you agree to it, then the next thing you're going to be asking is what's the path forward? What's your buying process? Who's involved? Who do I need to talk to? But you would never get to those questions if that wasn't visualized in your mind as the outcome is what you wanted to achieve. So you really have to have direction. And you really need to pay attention before you do anything as to what the true goal or destination is that you're trying to achieve. I love it. So velocity mindset, speed plus direction equals velocity. Know the outcome of each step of the process. And how many steps are in the process? You kind of have a framework that you go by. So the first thing is, is that I would do what's called a grounding. Ground myself into the appropriate goal. And to get myself into the right mindset of what I'm going to do. And I don't believe in scripts, David. A lot of people use scripts. If you're scripting, you're not listening. Listening is a big part of velocity, okay? I have an agenda. An agenda is a different piece I need. So one, ground myself in the velocity mindset, what the goal is. Then two, what do I need to find out? Those become my questions. Where are you trying to go? Now, the reason we use the number three, if I ask you for one thing you want, you can't think of anything, then we're in trouble. But if I ask you for three, you're going to come up with at least one or two. And if I can't deal with the first one, at least I can have the second one to hang my hat on. And also three is a very powerful number in the English language. So he asked for three. And then they tell you. And then you want to ask more questions. You want to get their perception. Because the biggest one of the biggest things that get in our way, you know, those, those things that I said, you know, take away or create drag and resistance in our own velocity is our assumptions. How many times do we make assumptions in a day only to realize that we're wrong? You know, I called up some of our colleagues one time, did an unscientific uh, survey. And I said, you know, go, go back to all the um, assumptions that you made in, in the uh, last year. You know, think about some of the, 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 the biggest ones you made that didn't prove to be real. You got one in your mind? And they go, yeah, okay, what was it? Oh, you know, this person said it and I, we were close friends and I thought it was a dig and, and I said, how can he be so mean to me? How does he hate me? I said, what'd you do? Well, I stood on it for a few days. Oh, how well did that serve you? And then what happened? Well, every time he called me, I wasn't nice to him. I said, what did that do for you? And I said, well, and then, and then when he said those things to you, do you know what he meant by that? And no, well, maybe you should just go ask them. Well, they asked them and realized, oh my, what they were intending had nowhere near the impact of what 
they received it as. So assumptions, I said, how many days or weeks did you use? Did that, you know, because think about it, when you're bothered by something, you're not really productive. So basically they came up with all the key assumptions that they had that were wrong. They probably lost three weeks in a year. What could you do with those three weeks? Now look, that's unscientific survey, okay? And I know you like data, but we all can relate to the last assumption we had that bothered us and then we realized it was wrong. You know, when we teach communications, everybody thinks that because I communicate with you, it was an effective communication and it's not. What we have to recognize is, is that when I say something to you, you're taking those words and you're putting it through your filter of your biases and past experiences, right? And therefore you get a different perception as to what I meant. And there's one more thing that we're doing in communications. Often we trigger other people. If I'm saying something to you, like for example, I had a, a CEO, we were talking and you know, he came out of a very difficult period, you know, and nearly went under. Now he's fine. He's got the bank working with him. And now as part of his uh, get well scheme, you know, he figured, let me sell the building, you know, get some money back from that and do a lease. So he found someone who really liked him and says, this is a great business you got and all that good stuff. Um, we're going to do it. Then he gets a call from the guy a week later and the guy says to him, so now we're getting serious. really looking in. It seems like your business is risky. And then my client, all of a sudden, his energy just drained. He goes, up. and he said to me in the coaching call, oh, here we go again. I said, whoa, wait a minute. He just triggered you. Yeah, why? Because you heard that from banks and banks that gave you a hard time, right? Yeah. But you're not having empathy for him. You're letting your triggers get out of the way. That's not what he meant. What he was saying to you is now he's looking at the due diligence. It's his right to make sure he's making the right investment. And if you sounded Anywhere near like what you just sounded to me, he's already losing interest. He may have even done as a test to see how you responded. You should go back to him, call him back up and say, hey, you know, when you said this could be a risky business, say, you know, on the face of it, it could be. And you're right. And we were in the dumps. Well, we pulled it out and you can see where we are right now. But you and I know one thing that when you invest in the business and in the building or whatever, you're not just investing in the business, you're investing in the people at the top. And I'm the person who brought this company back to where it is today. And I'm the person you're making the investment in. It's a totally different way to address it. And he turned it around. And they're still into the final negotiations and he's probably gonna get that investment. So we all get triggered. You have to understand when you're getting triggered, understand it's just a trigger and then ask yourself, is this really what the person meant? And most of the time, it's not. Hey, it's Sam from the Trust Edge team. Most training and development initiatives don't last or even solve the root issue hindering your organization. That's where Trust Edge coaching certification comes in. Trust Edge coaches are equipped with a suite of tools to identify, benchmark, and close gaps in trust for good. Because when you solve the real issue, you get measurable results in a culture where people actually want to make an impact. So whether you're a coach with your own clients or a leader training people inside your organization, check out trustedgecoaching.com and see how you can start solving the root issue and get lasting results in your business. And now back to the show. Let's the book. The new book is Velocity Mindset. Give us if, so, what 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 do we expect? We read Velocity Mindset in one sentence or two. What what are we gonna get? You're going to learn how to eliminate risks in your life, gain buy-in, and achieve better results faster. I like it. Direction plus speed. Don't forget yes. about direction as far as velocity is concerned. You go too fast the wrong direction, doesn't do, a right, uh, doesn't do any good. Probably worse, right? So Worse, and you get a lot of aggravation. You got to do it all over. Well, we, we talk about, as we come toward uh, some of the closing work here, we, we talk about, uh, you know, habits that leaders have, trusted leaders tend to have habits. What, what, what are you doing consistently these days to, to be high trust and healthy as a leader? So one thing that I learned from Nito Cobain, who was the past president of NSA, and he also wrote the forward as the president of High Point, he told me one time that he sends out three cards to three different people each day. Stay connected with people. So that's what I do. Sometimes it's cards, sometimes it's phone call, 
I know yesterday I called Fort Sakes. He didn't, we haven't spoken, you know, before my surgery. And I said, Fort, how are you doing? I just want to see how you're doing. It just shows that you're there for them, not always when you want something, number one. Um, what I'm also doing, and this is the way I led all my sales calls, but now with COVID, it forced everybody to do it. Don't make a sales call, make a help call. It's a different connotation and it sets you up for a different set of actions. Uh, the next one you're gonna love, um, it comes on the boundaries, keep your word. The moment you, you know, I always say to audiences, you know, you can take my money, hopefully you won't. You can take my family, hopefully you won't. You can take my house, hopefully you won't. But if you did, and I still had my word, I could find someone to invest in me, to start over. But it's when you break that word and you break that trust, it's hard to find people to back you again. So, you know, now the reality is you can't always keep your word. Make that your process of what you strive for. What are you learning these days? What's your new, what's the new learnings of the last just very short time? You've written, you'd written the book, you're, you, you, you know, we're learning every day. What are you learning now? Uh, basically staring at the sun, you know, coming to grips, you know, with our mortality and, and how can I be a better person for the time that I have on this earth to my daughter, to friends like you, to my audiences and understand that it's not about me. It's always about them, but we always get in the way. So I'm constantly looking at, you know, what I can do differently to keep myself out of the picture and be there a hundred percent present. One of the things I still struggle with is being present in conversations because I have ADD. So my mind's going off in all different directions. Now that's good for consultant because I can see the problems pretty fast, but if you're not really being present, people can tell when you're not present and then it affects concepts like trust and, and them believing in you and so forth. So I'm still working on how can I be better present when I'm speaking to individuals, family, clients, and so forth. That's challenging. I was just talking that uh, about a podcast I was interviewed on right before this, that, you know, as consultants, we, we learn how to solve the problems. We learn how to critique. We can see that. That isn't the best way to be at home. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like being present and bringing oh, up. Oh, honey, this is what you got to do. One, yeah. two, three, end of drill. Next. <laughs> but, but you want it to be heard. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, with that, let's jump to the lightning round. And here we go. Uh, we got uh, just a few questions. Answer them fast. And you've answered some already. But we'll let you go with it. What's a favorite book or resource you've given some? Maybe you want to reiterate or have a new one. Favorite book or resource right now? Irv I'm staring at the sun. Made a big impact on me. Love it. What's a what's a, a, a tech or gadget or app that you like right now or that you're using um, or a gadget, anything that you, you're, you're liking right now? I use now? Evernote. Yep. And the reason I use Evernote is because um, it's the one thing that I can keep track of everything I say because I always forget it. So if it's a coaching client, I'm keeping track of the coaching sessions. If it's a, um, a project, I'm keeping track of a project and it goes to all my devices. So Evernote's the one that, that makes me the most productive. It's a great one. It's yeah. a great one. Best advice or a good piece of advice. You've got so much, but a best piece of advice you've been given or quote you you think about. Live today like it's your last day. Hmm. Live today like your last day. And that's a perfect... Perfect segue to this question, which is one thing left for Ron Carr to do, one bucket list or one hope for the future? Improve my golf score. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it, it really is. Uh, I'm divorced 10 years, you know, and I've been real busy with my career and everything. And uh, my ex-wife and I are very good friends. But when we were married, we didn't appreciate each other. So what I'm yearning for is to have that one relationship on this earth that I can be the best to that individual and vice versa and um, this fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Great. Where can we find more about Ron Carr? Where, go sure. ahead. Well, the website is roncarr.com. Now you gotta be careful because people can spell car differently. It's K-A-R-R. So it's roncard.com and we have our blogs and we got videos. And also if you follow me on LinkedIn, we're posting two videos a week. And we're also on all the other social media like uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook and so forth. 
And we'll put that all in the show notes, trustedleadershow.com. It'll all be there as well as some of the top takeaways from this. I love the idea. Get to know, get, get the, the, uh, mindset, velocity mindset, and these ideas around grounding and uh, make it, I love this, make a help call, not a sales call and staying connected with others. And uh, a, a whole lot of, I've got a couple pages of notes here, but speed and direction is what it's all about. I love that. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so my much for, for, for being my friend. We have one final question for you. It's the Trusted Leader Show. Who is a leader you trust and why? I guess, you know, one leader I would say is George Bush Sr. And the reason is this. Um, he, when he became president, he, he knew he was president of the whole country. And he knew that sometimes he's going to have to make a decision that's not popular. And a leader makes the unpopular decisions, even if it can cost you something. And he ran on the premise, no new taxes, read my lips. And unfortunately, he got in there, he had a war, and he had to raise taxes, and he knew he had to do it for the good of the country, and it cost him the re-election. To me, that was a leader. Not about taxes, I don't like taxes, don't get me wrong, but he did what he felt he had to do for the betterment of the country. We try to keep commitments, we make them and try to keep them, there are changes made. I mean, I think it was even Abraham Lincoln who said, I hope I'm not the same tomorrow as I am today. I have to take in the new information. I have to adjust. I have to think about these kind of things and try to still run my decisions on same principles. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm principled running them, caring about the country and whatnot. So that's a great one. Well, Ron. And that's the other thing I look for in the leader. Are they doing it for others or are they doing it for themselves? Yeah. And you can see through that very easily. Miles away, undeniably. Ron, thank you for your authenticity and vulnerability. Thanks my for uh, being my friend. Thanks for sharing with our Trusted Leader audience. And uh, to all of you, thanks for joining us on the Trusted Leader Show. Until next time, stay trusted.